Math and Science. We are very pleased to have you here at Patio Chico of Salamanca, and we would like to give a warm welcome to all who are following our session via streaming. Now we are starting calling Jesus Maria Hernandez, Professor of Hematology at the Department of Medicine at the University of Salamanca. Thank you. Thank you so much, and this is a pleasure for me to be here today and to have the good fortune of introducing Professor Kun Sang from the UC San Diego St. Jacobs School of Engineering at California. Professor Sang is a true expert on molecular engineering and biotechnology with a specialization in genomics. He and his group developed pioneer methodologies in single cell sequencing and applying these new technologies to the analysis of stem cells, the human brain and other organs. He recently, or he's going to move to Altos Labs, one of the biggest companies in the area across the world. Today, Professor Sang will talk to us about honing in cellular stress and senescence through cell Atlas Construction. Professor Sam, welcome to Salamanca. Um, I, this is really my pleasure uh, to be here speaking uh, to this audience uh, in the beautiful city of Salamanca, and I really appreciate the, the host and the meeting organizer uh, for um, putting together this wonderful event. Um, so um, today I would um, give you a story um, about how we use um, um, some really advanced technology on, on single cell analysis to study one of the human organ um, and, and think about you know, injury, um, repair, um, and how does that happen during aging? How does that happen in disease progression? And, and hopefully that will motivate uh, some idea about um, slowing down aging, reverse uh, um, damage, and, and um, increase the health spans. So um, my, my work is mostly on technology. Um, I'm in the engineering school. So over the years, um, my group have been working on microfluidics. Um, these are microfluidic chips making little uh, droplets, really, really tiny, uh, so that uh, you can capture individual cells um, to do genetic an analysis. Um, we also use advanced imaging technology so that allow you to look at um, gene and protein um, in a piece of tissue and not look at one or two, but many, many of them so that you can uh, identify their pattern um, and their organization in the piece of tissue uh, during a healthy state and an injury state. Um, and in the past few years, we have been trying to apply these technology uh, to a number of human organ. Um, some of the work that we did uh, include um, uh, mapping the human brain, um, how a normal brain works, um, how normal brain function because brain is the um, most sophisticated organ um, uh, on human and uh, actually just on, in the planet. Um, we also apply these technologies systematically on uh, two other uh, human organs. One is on human lung and the other is on human kidney. Um, so today I, I, will, I will share a story on kidney but some of these ideas can also be applied uh, to other organs. Uh, and some of the insight actually are, are kind of uh, consistent uh, um, across different organs. Um, and I want to say that I myself, my training is more on engineering, um, so I'm really not an expert in specific tissue and organ. I am like this kid that has a binocular, these meaning technology, that that I go to different city and tour and I'm, and with the finding I'm reporting to you. Um, and I, I'm also working with uh, expert in, in uh, pathologists, uh, biologists in these areas um, to gain more insight about you know, what, what are these observations, how does that uh, connect to disease and rejuvenation. So um, I want to introduce you, uh, kidney is 
one of the very important organ. Uh, every people here have two kidney. Um, if you, you have one, you can survive, uh, but it's not optimal. Um, kidney is one of the organ, is the organ in charge of um, maintaining homeostasis of your body. Um, basically, just you know, maintaining electrolyte, uh, water exchange, uh, maintaining your the pH of your body, and also maintain your blood pressure. Um, a lot of your waste um, goes out uh, through kidney um, on a daily basis. Um, in kidney diseases, um, actually, I th somehow one slide is missing. So, uh, kidney actually can have many kind of injury. Um, one kind of injury is like what we call acute kidney injury. For example, you have a urinary tract infection, or for example, COVID. Actually, uh, COVID hit lung first, but the second organ that get hit very badly is kidney. Um, um, mostly uh, these are endocytial cells in the kidney. Um, and also in chronic disease, for example, uh, if you have hypertension or um, diabetes, um, some of these patients have kidney uh, uh, reduced function on the kidney um, very soon. And, and for, for some diabetic patient, at one point they need to have a transplantation of kidney. And so, so that, that actually is, is, a, is a very, very difficult situation. And um, chronic kidney disease is one of the disease so far that you don't actually have a very good drug. Um, in cancer, there are many, many drugs. Uh, some work, some doesn't work very well. But the kidney is an um, organ that you really don't have any good drug even today with modern technology. So um, we started uh, to work with on kidney um, about five years ago. Uh, we were part of uh, this uh, US NIH uh, Kidney Precision Medicine um, uh, Consortium. Um, we started by directly working with a human sample, clinical sample from patient. Um, in this consortium, we recruited a number of patients um, that they have you know, diabetes or have, they have transplantation. Um, these are the volunteer that allow us to actually, um, under the guide of ultrasound, use needle to punch them three times. We can only punch them three times. Otherwise, this is called minimally invasive um, collection of biopsy uh, for research purpose. Um, if you punch them three times and you do it very well, the patient will not have too much uh, pain um, and they can recover relatively quick. Um, but if you do it too much, then you will have uh, excessive damage. So um, if you use needle to punch three times, you can collect tiny, tiny amount of tissue within the middle of what we call core biopsy. Um, and so these are really, really precious sample because number one, recruiting these patients are not easy. Number two, these patients, uh, we are monitoring them for at least 10 years to look at how they're doing, not today, but tomorrow, next year, the year after. We're collecting urine, we're collecting blood sample from this patient. Um, so by collecting these core biopsy and correlating with what they're, how they're doing um, one, two, or five years later, uh, you can learn a lot about the disease progression and, and what is happening, what you're seeing now in, in, in this kidney core can allow you to have assessment of of their um, kidney function um, down the road. So these are really, really precious sample. Um, and so we, we have to come up with a, a very uh, systematic way to process the sample, not wasting a tiny, even a tiny bit of, of the tissue sample. And so uh, this is a big consortium that we came up with different technology, and each technology we have to validate this technology over and over again, making sure that if we have a piece of sample come in, we can have really good result out because if you, if you lose this piece of sample, you can never get it back. Um, and so go through this process, um, and actually, just to make sure it works, initially when you're doing this needle biopsy, uh, the clinician are using apple to play with this, and just punch a needle in the middle of apple and see, you know, uh, if you have a tiny piece of apple in the middle of needle, can you split them carefully and, and run all the assay um, in the right volume? Anyway, so um, 
going through this effort, we, we actually um, systematically collect sample and then um, analyze them uh, using a variety of technology. Um, and I will just, you know, for this audience, I will skip all the technology detail um, and, and just uh, report to you that, um, oh, actually, um, this is an older slide. Um, we, while we're testing the technology, we already analyzed uh, about 10 patient sample, and that, that led us to actually um, uh, examine 18,000 single cell. And with those 18,000 single cell, we, we were able to define a, a preliminary map of human kidney has roughly 30 different cell types. Um, and that, that actually captured um, the, the, um, the uh, almost a major cell type in the human kidney. I'm sorry, I actually changed my slide last night, but, but this is the older version, so the order is slightly off from what I was thinking. <laughs> um, anyway, so we, um, and three years later, we went through a lot more systematic effort um, using different technology, lo looking at more than 40 patient sample, um, and, and for some of the sample, we use more than one technology so that we, we can capture a, a holistic view of this kidney uh, sample. Um, and that led to um, a map um, that, that I will describe to you later on. Um, so basically, we, if you have a kidney biopsy core, you split into different parts, you go through different technology um, using microfluidics, using some other advanced sequencing or imaging technology, and later on, that will lead to a, 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 what we call a cell atlas. So here is a cell atlas. Basically, here, individual dot is a cell, and when we group them together, that means uh, they're kind of similar cell type, um, and then you can uh, pretty much capture all the major cell type uh, in a kidney. Um, we, we try to be very, very systematic on, on naming the cell type. Um, so we work with, with a clinician, kidney expert, um, to come up with the um, nomenclature. These are the um, unique and specific term that we can call uh, different cell type. So for example, we define the structure, uh, anatomy, tubule, and then we design, def define descending limb, ascending limb, loop of Henle, etc. And then for each of the structure, we define individual cell type. We came up with serious number, uh, this ID, that hopefully they will never change again, so that in the future we can, we can use a consistent name to, to name all the cell type in the human kidney. Um, and then we also identify specific marker genes, so these are the genes that we allow us to label specific um, uh, cell type. Um, so, so that led us to uh, uh, what we call a healthy um, reference that has about 49 cell type that capture every cell that we know uh, in the human kidney. Um, and to make that easier uh, to, to, to the community, we create a web portal um, here that, um, that everyone, if you have a data set you generate on your own, you, sh you can just go there and then you, you upload your data. Uh, we will use the, this reference data to quickly do annotation um, so that we can, we can uh, label uh, any cell type that present in your data set um, using this uh, reference. So that's an that's a, a easy way that can help other people to analyze their kidney data set. Um, we are also using um, another class of technology um, to look at the spatial organization um, of, of the kidney. Um, one example, I, you know, today we are at this uh, beautiful cathedral, actually two cathedral. The technology I showed before to analyze kidney is like we're taking apart this building and we're looking at individual pieces of stones or nuts and bolts. Uh, but that's good, but that doesn't capture the structure, the beautiful structure and the style of this, uh, uh, of the, uh, this cathedral. With the spatial technology, we're actually taking picture. We're looking at how these stones that piece together to form shape and curve and have function. Um, so we, we have one technology that um, was developed by MIT uh, uh, Bro Institute um, that we can capture these uh, spatial technology at 10 micro resolution. That's roughly the resolution of one individual cell. Um, and then we're using another technology uh, developed by a company called Tenex Genomic that can capture this uh, much larger area, 55 micron, that, that is, uh, can capture co-localization of multiple cells in the neighborhood. So that allows us to look at this uh, functional niche uh, in the kidney tissue. Um, 
So this is just one of the example of the normal uh, kidney tissue that you know, different color represent different cell type, and you can see some, for example, the purple streak, that's actually the, the a tubule uh, in the kidney that you can capture um, in, in a very high resolution. Um, and if you zoom in to this uh, little square box, actually it captures a, a ver very important functional unit, what, what we call the renal capsule. Um, this is basically the, the functional filtration unit uh, in, the, in the kidney. And then um, we can actually map all the cell type uh, that, um, in the spatial location um, that, that um, represent the, the renal capsule uh, in the human kidney. Um, and then you can also identify you know, these marker genes that are uniquely labeled each individual cell type. Um, after we actually define what a normal kidney or the healthy kidney would look like, we started to actually look at um, the injured kidney. And just a, you know, just an introduction, in kidney or in many other organs in the body, uh, you, you have th these healthy cells uh, that in the diagram is shown as a, as a blue box. For various reasons, um, these cells might have some stress or get into some injury state that we call altered state. When these cells are in the altered state, they can do a number of different things. Some cells can actually start to divide, get into cell cycle, and try to repair themselves, um, and they come back into the, the blue uh, color, which is healthy. Some actually go through a degeneration process, and eventually they go to apoptosis, and they, they just commit suicide and just die. Some others get into a different path, fall into a different path, what we call maladaptive state, where they just get trapped there, and they're just sending out a bad signal. These are senescent signals, cytokines. Um, and if you actually look at the, the, the model uh, tubular injury in the kidney, there's actually those maladapted cells that can actually send out a, a lot of signal, secretion signal, and fibrotic inflammatory signal that can, number one, uh, turn on uh, fibroblasts and go through this uh, fibrosis process and also attract a lot of immune cells and get into a niche that eventually uh, can lead to fibrosis um, in the kidney, and actually that also happens in many other organs. But if they're doing well, then these cells should be repaired and get, into, get back into a recovery state. So the question is that why you know, some, some tissue actually go to fibrosis, why some go to this recovery state? Um, so we went through this, all the data uh, ver in a very systematic way. Um, this is a, probably the largest data set out there on human kidney um, that will be public very soon. Um, and we systematically define what are the normal state, what are the altered state. And in total, we define 49. These are really you know, healthy kidney state and 29 altered state um, of different cell type. Um, it turns out that most of um, these other states are either what we call degenerative state and then alter epithelial cell and then alter stoma cell with fibroblasts. Um, if you look at this here, this is one of the, on the lab, these are the uh, healthy kidney. Um, right, we have the chronic kidney disease. You see a lot of signal there and the, that actually is the um, alter epithelial cell signal present in the a piece of kidney biopsy. And then you actually you can go through all the sample that we have and, and you can count you know, how many different cell types that could be into this uh, degenerative state or altered state. And it turns out that um, epithelial cell and fibroblasts um, are dominating. Um, so this is one of the examples that um, we have a piece of tissue that you can take the histology image. And, and, and a, a kidney pathologist will, will tell you that this is the area of fibrosis. And then we can say that there's another area that has what we call the alter proximal tubule. The, using the technology that we have, you can actually capture the RNA of exact same location of that piece of tissue. And then we can start to do molecular analysis. By looking at the gene expression of tissue in that fibrosis area and alter area, we can actually find out what cell type that are present. So in this case, you in this area, you see a lot of fibrosis, alter fibrosis cell in that area. Whereas uh, in this area, you see a, some signal, what we call alter proximal tubule cell. We can find these signal, and also we can actually see uh, two kind of immune cell, um, monocyte derived um, 
uh, cell and the neutrophil that are present in different locations of this uh, injury niche. This allows us to identify this uh, injury neighborhood and find out what is the interaction of cell type. Um, as I'm going to you know, try to um, tell later, actually, typically all the problems start with these proximal tubules. And then they attract immune cell, and then they remodulate the local fibroblast and, and, and turn it into the, on a cascade of fibrosis. Um, that, you know, in some patient, that, that just uh, a way of no return. Um, in the two segment of kidney, one is what we call the auto proximal tubule. The second is auto uh, uh, sick ascending limb. Those are the area that actually has the highest concentration of auto signal that we can actually draw a diagram. So here are individual cells. We can find that a lot of all the proximal tubule, they can go through a, a path of repair that go back to normal kidney uh, proximal tubule cell. But some of them, they go up this path and get into this uh, um, degenerative uh, path that there's really a no return. Uh, with a sick ascending limb, most of them actually can go back to this uh, um, normal state. Um, this is, this is a, re as a repair process. So these are the two most dominant dominating um, pro uh, cell type in the kidney that show these uh, injury signal. Um, going to individual cell type and cell state, we can identify all these marker gene that actually um, show signature of no aging sign, for example, P21, P27, and P16, uh, they show high signal in this auto state compared with the healthy cell. And they also show this high aging score or this uh, senescent score um, um, that, you know, based on the signature that has been discovered in, in mouse study. So these are the cells that, number one, they show up in acute injury. Number two, they show up in chronic injury. Number three, these are the cells actually can also be the driving force in the aging uh, and senescence in the kidney. Um, one of the, one of the observations we found is that if you know this uh, cell that has carried the signature, um, and you can compile a score based on, based on you know how strong the signal is. We can define um, one is called uh, auto uh, auto epithelial um, score. Um, one of the auto epithelial score is uh, what we call ATEL. Um, if you use the score and then you go to other patients' the kidney biopsy. We found that this score alone can predict a, whether a patient would do well or not well five years after you collect a biopsy from the patient. Uh, so this is a longitudinal study where you know, um, there's a, a different group. They're taking a piece of biopsy from individual patient and then keep looking at them for five to seven years. Using the score that we discovered um, in, in, our, our, in our data set, we can have very good predicting power on those that are not doing very well and those that are doing very well. That means uh, in the future, uh, using this score alone, it can actually guide the development of therapy. Um, finally, I, I want to mention that on the score that we discovered, all these observations came from human uh, specimen. That means you're only taking a snapshot from individual patient at one time because it's, it's very difficult to get a sample from the same patient many times. So sometimes when you're taking snapshot, you don't know the sequence of event. Uh, it's hard to find out exactly um, what caused what. So what we are doing is that using the signature we derived from human patient, we actually go back to mouse um, because mouse you can do experiment. Um, so there's a, there was actually an experiment that was done by another group where you actually trick a mouse uh, injury in the kidney, and then you can collect sample at multiple time points. So we actually took their data set and used our signature to do annotation. What we found is that um, actually in four hours after injury, you already see a lot of um, degeneration signal. And degeneration signal actually go down, you see some other signal actually show up, and eventually you have this uh, um, recovery at, at uh, six weeks. Um, 
if you get into the detail, um, this is a mouse before the injury. You see a lot of green here. That means there's really not too much damage. And, and there are some you know, sporadic signal. You can see, consider that as a background. After four hours after injury, you started to see a lot of degeneration signal pop up. And then you also have some uh, other signal. That's actually what we call the adaptive state I, I mentioned before. 12 hours, all these green signal, green signal disappear. That means you have a really bad injury that, that you know, almost all the cell in proximal material already become this degenerative state. But then after two days, actually, you, you, you have a lot of healthy signal coming back. Um, and then you actually also have this uh, blue signal, which is cycling. That means that some cells start to divide and try to re uh, replenish the damaged cell in, in that niche. In 14 days, uh, you still see some signal here, but you see more and more green back. That means uh, the kidney is, is getting uh, back to, uh, to, to more healthy state. And in six weeks, um, a lot of signal pretty much disappear. And then this mouse has actually has a um, pretty healthy kidney. So what I'm showing you here is that the signature that we discovered from human patient can be recapitulated in this kidney injury model. And, and that signature is really conserved. Um, so that means using this signature, you can actually you know, find out how many cells are in certain state um, and whether there's a chance that they can come back or actually they get into the state of, of no return. Uh, um, so we have a lot more data more recently, and I'm just showing you that here we have a lot of reference samples. These are from pe people that are look healthy, but actually none of us is really healthy. Okay, in a kidney, you have a you already have some these signal. These are the what we call the degenerative state, but actually that's okay. Um, if this cell can be repaired, like what I've sh I'm showing you in the mouse, in a few weeks you're fine. What's really troubling is that if you get into some of these uh, uh, maladaptive states and they stay there uh, for too long and they're sending out these inflammatory signal, attract immune cell and trigger fibrosis, that will actually lead to longer term uh, uh, kidney uh, degeneration and, and uh, re reduction of the function. Um, so if you look at this acute kidney injury and this chronic kidney injury, Really, what you're seeing is this increased signal. These are individual patients, okay? You see a much increased signal in this uh, green phase. Um, and that, that is this, uh, what we call the adapted uh, epithelial state. So that is the signal that actually tend to tell you that the kidney is, is doing something. And especially in these chronic kidney ca disease cases, those signals will tell you that maybe some of the cells actually are in the state that actually can um, um, as a way to get to a point of no return. Um, so I just a quick summary. Um, in the past few years, we, we work with, as a big consortium, we kind of define what we call the version 1.0 kidney atlas of human, that we carefully define all the cell types that are healthy. Um, and then comparing this healthy cell with the um, healthy sample with a sample from uh, chronic kidney uh, disease patient and acute kidney disease patient, we carefully defined 29 different alter states that some are just in the middle of repair or, or injury, and some actually uh, um, get further uh, to the point where um, and they can lead to uh, long-term damage and senescence. And we found that this uh, dynamic transition of, of, of this uh, uh, alter state actually can be recap recapitulated uh, in the mouse model. Um, so that, that will tell you actually which lead to what, and then if, if cell, uh, the tissue is doing well, uh, uh, how, how certain cell type can, can come back. We also found that there are these uh, signature, the two signature that are really strong, especially the, the uh, ascending limb signature. With that signature, you can predict the patient's outcome um, five to seven years from the point where you are collecting a tissue sample. Um, and, and so that, that's pretty much what I have to um, uh, share with you uh, using my monocular uh, going through a kidney. Um, 
So this work is, was, uh, was really a result of a large team uh, by my group, my collaborator, wonderful collaborator, and by NH. So with that, I'd like to close and I'd be happy to um, answer any question or move to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. That was very interesting. Olga Calvo is researcher at CSIC and director of Institute of Biology and Functional Genomics. I will now introduce the second speaker. Thank you, Olga. Thank you and good morning. As a scientist, and in particular as a biologist, it, it is a great honor for me. <laughs> Do I hear? You can hear me? No, okay. <laughs> Let's start. So as a scientist and as a biologist in particular, it is a great honor for me to introduce today Vera Gorbunova, professor of biology at the University of Rochester and co-director of the Rochester Aging Research Center. Dr. Gorbunova pioneered the comparative biology approach to study aging. She has published more than 100 publications in the most prestigious scientific journals and media. For that reason, she has been recognized with awards from many organizations such as the Ellison Medical Foundation, the Glenn Foundation, and the American Federation for Aging Research, among others. Vera Gorbunova is with us today to talk about a very relevant topic for longevity research with the lecture the mechanism of longevity and epigenome stability. Welcome, Vera, you have the floor. Okay. <coughs> ah, buenos dias. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Is my microphone on? Okay. Good. All right. So it's not working? It's working. It's working. Okay. It's not good. It's not good. It what? seems to not be working. No, for no the but they say they can hear. Yeah, it's working. The, the, the it's no, working. No, it's not working. No, it's working. Listen to me. <laughs> the, the petaga, you have to put on. Oh, okay. Now okay, it's okay, now it's working. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I've been studying aging for many, many years. And I want to start with this slide uh, of the Fountain of Youth by a, a Spanish painter. So people were looking for this Fountain of Youth for many years. Um, and uh, we continue looking for it. But now we use scientific method. <laughs> because before, well, as I read, part of the reason for exploration of America uh, was to find the fountain of youth. So now instead of setting sail on the ship, um, we use molecular biology, genetics uh, to find this fountain. Uh, one of the approaches that uh, my group is taking is using comparative biology or we go back to nature to look at animals that are exceptionally long-lived, and then we want to find the mechanism that make them um, so long-lived and also resistant to disease. So here we're just talking about mammals, no sharks or turtles, just animals like us, very close to us, and still there are up to 100-fold differences in maximum lifespan uh, from mouse that lives uh, two to three years um, to naked mole rats that are the same size but live 40 years. Uh, well, bats, you know, very famous creature recently after the pandemic. And now this is the longest lived mammal, the bowhead whale or the Arctic whale that lives more than 200 years. So the goal is to find what are the mechanisms that are different between species on this end of the spectrum and this end of the spectrum, and then use these mechanisms to benefit human health. 
uh, because in these animals, they are exceptionally healthy. Not that they just live long, because if you are in the wild and you get sick, you don't survive very long. So whatever mechanism of longevity they have, it's exactly what we want to have. We don't want to stay around just you know, barely alive. We want to be healthy. So this is the overall philosophy that we applied in the lab. So this is our workflow. Uh, we study these exceptionally long-lived animals. We identify the mechanism. And today I will talk a little bit about this animal and this one. Well, I won't talk about bats. But although it, they're also very interesting. So once we identify this mechanism, we create mouse models where we mimic this adaptation because we can genetically manipulate mice. We see whether it helps them. And if it does, so then we can develop pharmaceutical approaches to mimic the same environment in humans. And, and this is something that now can be translated to human patients. OK, so I will say a few words about the naked mole rat. So this is a very interesting creature. It's the same size as a mouse, but lives more than 10 times longer. Uh, they are resistant to all kinds of diseases. They almost never get cancer. Uh, they don't get arthritis. Uh, they are resistant to heart disease and stroke and neurodegeneration. So that's really a model of healthy aging. Uh, we've been studying naked mole rats for many years. And we discovered that their cells produce a very unique substance called hyaluronic acid. Well, it's not completely unique. Our cells also make it. But we make a lot less, and also the molecules are shorter. Uh, so we thought, OK, this molecule it, uh, helps um, naked mole rats live longer. It protects them from cancer. So that's something we published many years ago. Uh, and we decided, OK, can we? Uh, take this mechanism and export it into the mouse and see if the mice will benefit. So we made a mouse, transgenic mouse. It carries a gene for the synthesis of this molecule, hyaluronin. carries this gene from the naked mole rat. Uh, and we made these mice. We studied them. Uh, first, we tried to induce tumors in these mice. And these are controlled mice. They develop a lot of tumors. So these are. And these are the mice with the naked mole rat gene. And they have much fewer tumors. And even if we don't uh, torture them in any way, we just let them live out um, their lives, um, these mice develop fewer tumors. And finally, this is their lifespan. So this is percent of survival over time. You know, They keep dying as a population of any living things. So these are controls. And these are the transgenic. So these mice live about 10% longer. So now we, we took this mechanism from the naked mole rat into the mouse, um, and we were able to extend mouse lifespan. So now we're thinking, OK, how do we apply it to people? We don't want to make transgenic people. We want to have some very safe approach. Uh, so we are developing drugs, small molecules that people could take. And that would slow down degradation of this molecule of hyaluronin that we make. And it results in production of longer molecules and more of them. So just with our own gene, we can achieve the same result. And right now, we have such molecules. Uh, we are testing them in mice for now. We are testing whether it protects mice from cancer. And if it does, so that will be you know, direct indication now to go to human treatments. OK, so the next short story I want to tell you goes down to the core mechanisms of aging. And it has to do with genome and epigenome stability. So this is uh, something that Juan Carlos talked about yesterday. So those key mechanisms, what goes wrong as we age? Because we want to really target that, the, the cause of aging. Uh, so this is our DNA. Uh, as we live our lives, it's subjected to all kinds of damages uh, from external sources. Uh, from internal sources, just from our you know, physiology. Uh, and we have to repair it. Uh, but as we repair it, it's never perfect. So there are always mutations that are introduced. And this is one type of mutation. It's called double strand break. Both strands of DNA get broken. And this is very dangerous, because when it's repaired, or if it's repaired incorrectly, you can get these, these are called translocations. Uh, when a piece from one chromosome gets glued to another chromosome, it happens a lot in cancer. 
Uh, it also happens even in normal tissue as we age, we accumulate those events. So many of these events in our cells. Um, and this is a mutation, but what's even worse, uh, it results in so-called epigenomic drift. Um, and you know, this is like a very sad picture, something is drifting away. And that's actually what happens to our epigenome as we age, because there are many of these events of damage and repair, and things just don't come back together as they used to be. So, it, you know, to make it more clear, so this is our DNA in the cell, in the nucleus. Uh, when we are young, it's organized very nicely. There are some regions that need to be packaged very tightly. Other regions are open and active, uh, and everything works nicely. But as we get older, it just kind of unravels. Uh, things open up that shouldn't be opened up, uh, and the things that should be open get closed. And as a result, the whole thing just doesn't work as well. Uh, so I like this analogy of the sock drawer. When we are young, our epigenome is folded very nicely, and it's very easy to find the right socks in the morning. Uh, but as we get older, it becomes like that. Because like you go in and out in the drawer, right? And you mess things up, even if you're trying to put it back together, it still gets messed up. Uh, so this is the old epigenome. And try to find anything here, right? So how do we, how do we fold it back together? Right? Uh, because this is really what we are trying to achieve, to find a way to take this drawer and revert to this original young state. Um, Okay, so as we were trying to understand it, we thought, well, let's use comparative biology again. Uh, these are different species of rodents, uh, you know, short-lived, long-lived, uh, anything in between. And now uh, the hypothesis is that species that are long-lived, they should have better way of putting the socks together. So let's compare. Are they better at repairing DNA or not? Uh, so what we did, we took cells from all of these animals, we measured DNA repair, sorry, oh, okay, go back, yes, so we measured DNA repair, and what, to what turned out to be that uh, there was a perfect correlation uh, between how long these animals live, uh, or their species live, and how efficient their DNA repair was. And then we wanted to understand why. Yeah? So what's different between these long-lived species and short-lived species? And we found one protein called sirtuin-6 that had very low activity in the short-lived species and high activity in the long-lived species. And we could even take it from short-lived species into long and their DNA repair would improve. Uh, and then we even identified specific amino acids we could mutate and make mouse sirt 6 uh, just as good as beaver sirt 6 So here is a beaver, you know, that's our hero because they're very long-lived. They can live, you know, maybe 30 years, maybe more. Uh, so we could find specific amino acids we could swap between uh, short-lived and long-lived improved sirt 6 uh, So sirt 6 protein is very interesting. It's involved in repairing DNA, but it is also involved in putting chromatin back together, especially those regions of heterochromatin that should be closed. So sirt 6 its normal function is reinforce this heterochromatin, not to let things unravel. Uh, and then we got very interested. So here we see correlation with uh, lifespan of the animals. Now, what about humans? Will long-lived people have high SIRT6 activity, or would it benefit humans to have high SIRT6 activity? And here I want to show a family of centenarians. So this lady is 115 years old in this picture, and these are five generations of her descendants. And now yeah, she uh, is holding her great-great-great-great-great-daughter uh, in her arms. Uh, so these people called centenarians, uh, they are also, many of them are exceptionally healthy. They live independently, they uh, maintain employment and come back to the office uh, almost to the age of 100. So they don't develop, or they develop very late these age-related diseases. So we want to really achieve that for everyone. Why any, everyone couldn't live to 115 and stay healthy like that and uh, see five generations <laughs> of descendants. Uh, so we collaborated with the laboratory of Yusin Su, uh, who was sequencing genomes of centenarians, and we looked whether there are any mutations in this gene SIRT6 uh, that would be more common in centenarians. 
Uh, and we found two mutations in the C terminus of CERT6 protein in about the same region where we had differences between mouse and beaver. So we took those two mutations, uh, we engineered them, we tested how they affect the function of CERT6. Uh, and this is a DNA repair assay. Uh, we compare, so this would be the wild type CERT6 like all of us in this audience have, and this is CERT6 from centenarians. So it was better at inducing DNA repair. So that makes sense, right? So better DNA repair, longer life. Uh, it was also better at maintaining heterochromatin. So these are, this is our genome. And only a small fraction of it encodes for genes, like very small. Everything else are these repetitive elements or so-called genomic parasites, lines and signs that actually unravel as we get older. And CERT6 keeps them silent. So we m compared uh, wild type CERT6 and centenarian CERT6 and how good are they at keeping line one element silent. And centenarian was better. So it was better in these two different functions that are very much linked to longevity. And the way it was achieving that uh, was by binding to another very interesting protein called lamin A. Uh, Juan Carlos mentioned lamin A in yesterday's talk. So this is a very important protein in maintaining the structure of the nucleus, which would be the structure of that sock drawer. Uh, and here CERT6 binds to it, and the centenarian one binds more tightly and helps to maintain the whole structure more efficiently. So we still come to the same, the same idea of maintaining epigenome um, and now another hero, I mentioned the whale, the longest lived animal. So we were interested whether these animals are really good at DNA repair because it wasn't part of our original analysis where we mostly had rodents. So we took the whale uh, that lives over 200 years. Uh, we measured DNA repair in the whale and it was three times better than in human. So it's really difficult to beat human to anything. We are already long lived, but the whale did it. So it has even better DNA repair uh, and very accurate. Uh, so in humans, accurate repair events were just 15%. And in the whale, they were over 60%. Uh, so they are very efficient and very accurate. Okay. Uh, so then of course the question was, how do they achieve that? Uh, and after, you know, I'm not going into all the details how we search for this, uh, but we found one protein called KIRP, uh, cold induced RNA binding protein. So it's induced by cold, and these are Arctic whales. They live in a very cold water. Uh, and they have, like, almost, I would say, more than 50 fold, they produce more than 50 fold greater amount of this protein than humans. So it really jumped out at us. Uh, and this protein is important for DNA repair, among other things. Um, so we thought, well, this may be why they have such good DNA repair. And to test that, uh, we took this protein from the whale and we expressed it in human cells. Uh, so here we put it in human cells and then we measured DNA repair by the same method. Uh, and these are all human cells just human cells alone and human cells with the whale protein. It improves DNA repair in human cells. Uh, so well, this is one way to make things better, to borrow this property from the whale. But again, this was in cells. We can just put a gene in, but what to do you know, with people, something that's very safe. Um, and here we just took human cells and did a cold shock. So yesterday, Giovanna was talking about uh, swimming in icy water, so that's kind of the same idea. So we put cells in the colder temperature for a couple of hours. It induced the cold protein, and DNA repair got improved. So again, this is one safe strategy you can apply uh, to hopefully uh, improve your epigenome organization a little bit. So that's the summary for the whale. Again, in the whale, we find that they are better at genome maintenance. So the very last story I want to share with you was when we decided, okay, let's look at all the species in our collection and find what genes are more active in long-lived ones. Uh, so we did RNA sequencing, then uh, comparative analysis of all the genes. Uh, and what we found uh, were groups of genes that are 
more highly active in long-lived animals. And here we see homologous recombination, DNA repair, double strand break repair. Again, these pathways that are very important for genome and epigenome maintenance. And something also even uh, more exciting, we looked how these genes are controlled uh, by using <laughs> applying regulatory network analysis and analyzing transcription factors that bind to these genes. And we found that those genes that are expressed at high levels and long-lived animals are controlled by pluripotency transcription factors. So that was not something we expected, but that was really exciting. Uh, and those genes that are actually more highly expressed in the short-lived ones, so these are the genes we don't want to express at very high levels, they were controlled by circadian network, which circadian means what regulates, you know, night and day. So if you are up at night, you may actually increase expression of these genes. So um, not staying up at night may be another useful strategy <laughs> uh, to uh, promote longer lifespan. Uh, so here I, I'm coming back to the fountain of youth, but this time with the animals. <laughs> uh, and actually this picture, well, just yesterday I was told that it was chosen for the cover of cell metabolism, so I'm <laughs> proud of it. So now these animals around the fountain, uh, and the longest lived one is in the fountain, the closest to the water. So by using these animals, we can actually get closer to understanding of all these factors uh, that control lifespan. But, you know, how do we apply it practically? Yeah, that's the question. How do we bring the socks back together, uh, you know, from the old back to young, right? Uh, so we thought, well, we have to, you know, maybe use sirtuin 6 enzymes. So I showed you that, you know, it, it's supposed to be organizing the socks. Uh, so this is the... Uh, project we did in collaboration with Steve Horvath, uh, we expressed CERT6 uh, in fibroblasts from all the people, of, you know, very fresh, uh, low passage cells for two weeks only. And then we measured methylation age of these cells. And in uh, nine out of 10, so these were the control cells and these were cells with CERT6, the age went down. So we actually rejuvenated them by expressing CERT6. Uh, and then we looked what genes change and the genes that change were responsible for DNA conformation, DNA packaging. So all the correct processes we would have expected CERT6 to affect. Um, and then of course the question, how do we upregulate CERT6? So we did a screen for molecules that activate CERT6 uh, and other people are looking for them as well. And we were particularly looking for uh, activators of CERT6 mono ADP ribosylation activity, which is the one activity we found enhanced in centenarians. And there was one molecule that was activating this activity. Uh, and this is a molecule that is found in seaweed. And as you know, people in Japan, South Korea, consume a lot of seaweed. Uh, and these countries have one of the longest life expectancies, together with Spain. But maybe people in Spain consume something else that's very good. Uh, so this is the seaweed. And we thought, OK, um, you know, and the molecule is not something that, it's not a small molecule. It's a polysaccharide called fucoidin. Um, so we were not sure if it will actually penetrate the cells in the right way because it's a sugar, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, so we tried it on mice first. Uh, so we took mice, uh, aged mice, uh, we gave them a diet with fucoidin for two months. So we, they were just supplemented with seaweed. Uh, and we measured their frailty score, which is very similar to how uh, geriatricians me measure frailty score of people. Uh, and here you can see these are mice on control diet, and they have high frailty score. And these were mice that were supplemented with fucoidin, so their frailty score was lower. Um, so again, you know, eat seaweed. This is very safe. <laughs> and maybe, maybe it will help your epigenome. Uh, so this is um, basically what my last slide. Uh, so this is, you know, the process of aging. Uh, this is the bad thing that happens to our epigenome, but now we have strategies to reverse it. Um, to achieve epigenetic rejuvenation, uh, there are many different ways that can be developed to this end. Juan Carlos was talking about Yamanaka factors. Um, also, um, 
laboratory of Juan Carlos and Manuel Serrano uh, are looking for other ways, pharmacological ways to do the same thing. Uh, we also find these epigenetic factors like CERT6, uh, that their job is putting epigenome back together, so that may be another strategy. And this way we can actually not only slow down aging, but achieve rejuvenation. So I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, I would like to thank people who contributed to this work. So it's the work of many students and postdocs from my group. It was all done in collaboration with Andrei Sulanov, who is here, uh, and uh, many other external collaborators listed here in funding sources. And thank you very much. Do you mind? Thank you so much, Vera. Now we are taking questions from the audience. Kum, please. The first question is for Kum. Will be ever possible to stop diseases such as cancer before they arise? Okay. Uh, I have two answers for this question. The first is no, second is yes. Uh, and let me explain. <laughs> um, no is that um, it's very difficult to stop it before it arrives um, because you don't know what's, which organ will sell, the cancer will pop up. Um, this is a completely random process. Uh, that's why I said no. Um, the second part I would say yes is that um, people get killed by cancer um, when cancer starts to metastasize. Um, if cancer are local, um, very often you can just uh, use a surgery. Um, if local, they don't invade into your uh, vasculature. Um, a local surgery can, can almost completely cure cancer. So really, um, uh, the strategy we have here should be you know, very effective uh, early diagnosis. Um, detect them before they spread, and then follow up with uh, very uh, effective surgery and, and some localized therapy. Um, and one good example would be breast cancer. After we, you have mammogram and, and other uh, method, right now this five-year survival rate is about 95%. Um, so that, that's the, the better way to manage cancer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Second question is for Bera. What are the currently mechanisms available to extend people's life as young as possible? <laughs> well, so I mentioned some strategies during my talk. Um, you know, circadian regulation, very important. Don't turn your lights bright at night, you know, because that will activate those negative genes that we don't want to be active. Um, then uh, color restriction was discussed a lot yesterday. So maybe, you know, restricting yourself uh, constantly is uh, too difficult, but uh, maybe skipping a meal during the day so you feel a little bit of hunger or maybe you know if you are strong enough not eating one day a week so that is a very good strategy um, you know apparently cold exposure is good so maybe swimming in the cold uh, sea or you know cold streams here in Extremadura would be very nice <laughs> um, and uh, well I can recommend seaweed they definitely not going to hurt anyone or maybe will help as well and I, I'm sure there will be more targeted strategies coming up in the future thank you Vera third question to Kim how can technology help to slow down aging Wow, so um, there are many technology, right? So, um, for example, you know, during the talk yesterday and today, right, Juan Carlos mentioned this uh, uh, reprobing factor that can improve the resistance of cell uh, and, and uh, in terms of, you know, the response to, to injury. And like Vera just mentioned a few examples of SIR6 and, and other chemical that, that can kind of uh, improve the resistance and that, that is one way to, to kind of uh, uh, slow down or reverse aging. Um, the other strategy would be, for example, like the kidney example I mentioned, um, you have some cell like this auto epithelial cell or sometimes the, some endothelial cell that when they're not happy, they're sending out these uh, pro-inflammatory signal or probiotic sig uh, fibrosis, fibrosis signal that are actually modulating the local environment and introduce a lot of bad things. And so there's a strategy that was actually developed by, for example, that Manuel Serrano and other group on that's called Synalytic. Basically, you specifically find these uh, cells that are not happy and remove them, kill these cells. 
Um, and that, just remove them, it, it will actually improve the local environment and then it, it actually uh, has, a, has been shown to be quite effective in, in certain cases of improving uh, uh, tissue health and, and uh, slow down aging. Thank you. The last question is going to Vera. How are diseases such as cancer connected to aging? Well, this is an excellent question. So many diseases that uh, you know, kill people now are age-related diseases. It's cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia. All of them, the onset happens with aging. So aging makes us more susceptible to these diseases. So aging itself may not be a disease, but this is what makes us vulnerable. And this is why I, what we are doing is, I think, is so maybe so much better than addressing each disease individually. We ad address the root cause of it, which is aging. And if we find how to do it, so that may help eliminate all of these diseases. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Um, we have come to the end. We don't have more time, I'm afraid. Um, but we'll go into our next stop in a few minutes at Angustias Square, Angustinas, sorry, of the Monterrey Palace. Thank you very much, and please don't forget to, to return the headphones. Thank you. Mm -hmm.